We're returning to basics for this critical thought, as I want to talk again about the importance of your core gameplay loop, and what it means for beginning a game's design and taking it all the way through to the end. Now, this is basically game design 101 day one hour one kind of discussions here, but it's very important for everyone to understand what a core gameplay loop is. And for our definition, this is essentially the primary system or mechanic that will define your game. And this can be everything from platforming, racing, match 3, stealth, and so on and so forth. And as a game developer, you need to be able to figure out what your core gameplay loop is. Because you will never be able to make a good video game if you don't understand what this concept is. The good news is that it's very easy to come up with a core gameplay loop. It's a lot harder to maintain that from beginning to end of a game's development because a core gameplay loop by itself is simply a prototype. You can make a simple screen of a character running to the right and jumping or driving a car, but how everything ties together to be a great experience and one that keeps somebody invested in playing that takes work and it takes a lot of decision making and just understanding how your game grows to do it. And many independent developers, especially those on the first kind or first type variety, tend to get bogged down when it comes to maintaining their core gameplay loop. And we even see this in the AAA industry sometimes. The point is that when it comes to the core gameplay loop, every decision, every other system, every other decision that goes into your game must be filtered through it because that is the primary experience someone's going to have with your title and without it you don't really have a game and it's very easy when you start adding in ancillary systems new mechanics trying to change your art style or even trying to copy what's the big name game at the time to lose sight of your core gameplay loop and when that happens, that is usually one of the clearest signs that a game project has gone off the rails. You should not be changing your core gameplay loop 50 to 75% of the way done your game. Because this is how game development balloons exponentially out. Because anytime you change your core gameplay loop, everything else connected to it, which in this case is every other aspect of your game, is going to have to be changed as well. If you start designing your game as a platformer and they go, oh wait, let's add in a stealth detection system as well. Well, guess what? You're going to have to redesign all the enemies that have stealth elements. You're going to have to redesign all your levels to make use of that. You're going to have to change all the goals of your game, all the controls, and so on and so forth. And this basically amounts to you having to throw out a lot of your work and starting over again from scratch. And you can't really do that five to ten times during a game's development before you're going to probably run out of money or your entire team's going to hate you. But the beauty about adhering to your core gameplay loop is that some of the best games we've played over the last ten years, especially in the independent scene, they get their core gameplay loop settled and then they just keep making it better. And there are AAA examples of this as well that we'll talk about in a few minutes. But, again, when you lose sight of your core gameplay loop, and it can become very easy to do that when you start adding more to it, you'll typically find that these games just don't have that strong impact at first. Like we've said before, it is not good game design to demand a player to play for 10 to 15 hours before the real game starts, or before things become enjoyable. The best games, and this is going to be our motto for today's video, the best games start out great with their core gameplay loop, and they only get better from there. And when your game does that, you will have a title that will definitely keep bringing people back for more. And like I said, we're going to talk about our AAA market in a second here. But first, a quick shout out to our Patreon supporters as we switch to some game footage of a title that I'm really enjoying, despite the fact that it is nowhere near done, it's not even balanced yet, and they just start on early access. But I'll see you all after the break. And now a quick shout out to the supporters over on Patreon.com slash GWBicer. 
Hellsign has been a game that just came on Early Access that I have been enjoying a lot, despite the fact that the game is still very far away from hitting 1.0. And a big reason for that is that even at this early period, the game knows what it wants to be with its core gameplay loop. The progression of investigating these homes for paranormal activity, fighting monsters, and of course, busting ghosts. And all aspects of the game, from the progression system of getting new tools, upgrading your character, and even just the exploration, all factor or filter through that core gameplay loop. And this is another big point about why it's important to get it settled as quickly as possible. Because the core gameplay loop that we're talking about, we're not mentioning hours of gameplay. We're mentioning minutes. You should be experiencing the core gameplay of a title usually within like 5 to 15 minute long spurts, depending upon the design in question. The beauty is that the more somebody enjoys your game, those that 5 to 15 minute cycle is just going to keep getting better and better. For instance, there, like we said, there are AAA developers who are masters at this. Mario, uh, Nintendo, Blizzard, and probably a few other ones that I'm failing to remember right now at the top of my head. But with Nintendo, for instance, a Mario level is typically, what, two to five minutes long at most. But you are going to play every one of those levels because each one is a unique and different take off of Mario's platforming. Blizzard with Diablo is another prime example. We've talked before about the core gameplay loop of ARPGs. You fight monsters to get loot, to become more powerful, to fight more monsters, and etc, etc. But here's the thing. When you play Diablo or Path of Exile or Grim Dawn, any other ARPG, you are doing the same things 10 minutes in the game that you are doing 100 hours in. And it doesn't matter because you are still enjoying that gameplay loop. And like I said, it can be very hard sometimes to figure out just what it is that brings people to your game. But at the end of the day, it should the answer should always be your core gameplay. If people hate your, uh, I don't know, your RPG combat, but love your dating system that you have as a sub mode, that's kind of a big problem there. Because like I said, at the end of the day, if your main gameplay is not keeping people invested, nothing else is really going to matter. Like we were saying or seeing earlier with Assassin's Creed Odyssey and the complaints about how the game takes 15 hours to really come into its own, that is terrible design right there. When I played Hellsign here, I got into it within the first 15 to 20 minutes of play. And for fans of game wisdom, you know that I talk about this a lot. That if a game annoys me, especially its core gameplay loop, within the first 15 minutes of play, that's it. That game is pretty much going to be done in my list. Because I don't have time these days to quote unquote find the fun. And Hell Sign is another good example of this. This is not a quote unquote fun game. You're going to be dying a lot in the first 15 to 30 minutes of this title. But you're going to be learning how you play this game. Another great example, of course, is The Buying of Isaac. The Buying of Isaac is about 25 to 40 minutes of single playthroughs. But everybody watching this right now who's played The Buying of Isaac, how many of you stopped playing that game after just one win? Of course you did. And roguelikes are another great example of how a core gameplay loop can keep people invested. Playing games like Spelunky, Dead Cell, Slay the Spire, you name it, again, a single playthrough is not going to be 5 to 10 hours long. But each time you play it, something new is going to happen. There's going to be variants that's going to keep you guessing, that's going to keep you entertained. And again, figuring out what that core gameplay loop is should not take long. As I said in the first part, if you are 50 to 75% done your game's development and you still don't know what your core gameplay is, you are in deep trouble. And this is where a lot of AAA games during the last decade kind of got into trouble with this. When they were trying to copy Grand Theft Auto in terms of, it's not just a shooter, it's a stealth game, but it has driving, and we're also going to have hand-to-hand combat, and this and that. 
because all these elements were never really balanced to the core gameplay. And here's an interesting question for everybody watching. If push came to shove, with like a game like Red Dead Redemption 2 or Grand Theft Auto 5, how would you define what the core gameplay loop is of those series? Because again, you can't just say cowboy simulator or being a criminal. Those are descriptors. Those aren't gameplay systems. And Rockstar has really kind of been like the odd man out or the exception to this rule with their games. Because they tend to focus on a very wide berth of mechanics and systems rather than just saying, oh, you're just going to be driving for uh, 30 hours long. And that's actually one final point, then we'll be going to wrap things up. Because we've seen developers who will add subsystems in, but they do not, excuse me, distract from the core gameplay. I have a friend who's a big fan of the Forza series. And Forza has added in uh, leveling up systems, side challenges, and open world, all this other crazy stuff. But it all, once again, feeds back into the racing. And because of that, it makes that better and only makes it grow even more so over how many hours you continue to play. And of course, we see this with games as a service with more developers adding in content post-release to expand that core gameplay or add in new elements to augment it. So, with that said, we're going to wrap things up here for today's Critical Thought. Again, this is Design 101 stuff. And if you are a student or a first-time game developer, you may want to take some notes from this video. But with that said, we're going to wrap it up here. So thank you so much for watching. If you get your name listed on our Patreon sheet, be sure to check out patreon.com slash gwbicer. And I will see everybody next time. Until then, take care. If you're looking for another book about game design, be sure to check out my first title, 20 Essential Games to Study, out now. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoy things, be sure to do all the liking and subscribing that the kids are doing these days. Check out our Discord channel link down below where we hang out and chat game design. And come back later tonight for our regular streamings. But that's it. And tune in for more great content here and on Game Wisdom, where we examine the art and science of games.